Hello and welcome to my online YouTube uh, introduction to astronomy. This video is going to be the second part, or you could call it uh, the second lecture. Uh, whatever you want to call it, I haven't decided yet. But it is sort of an appendix to uh, the former lecture where I told you about uh, stuff like how you can find your way around on the night sky and stuff like that. And then I introduced shortly a program that we're going to use actually a lot in, in these lectures, and this is called Stellarium. Now, to be honest, you can use just about any kind of computer observatory that you can find anywhere, actually. It doesn't have to be Stellarium. The thing with Stellarium is that it's free, it's open source, and it's relatively lightweight. It's not as lightweight as a program like uh, Skycharts, uh, Cat de Seal, but it's relatively um, lightweight. So let's get started. So uh, as you can see, I am here on the Stellarium webpage. It is simply stellarium.org, as you can see here. And depending on what kind of operating system you have, you have to choose uh, from these here. So you can choose Linux, and you can use a Linux app image, and then you can use uh, Mac OS, and then you can get two kind of Windows, 32-bit and 64-bit, and that's it. For In my case, I am using uh, Windows 64-bit, so, uh, well, that's what I've done. But I have installed the program already, so I am not going to do it here, but then you uh, click on this little thingy here, and then you get a download, and then you in install it, and yada yada. You know the drill like that. Now, when you're in Stellarium, it can be, and I'm going to show you how to do that, uh, but it can happen that you cannot download the extra star catalogs um, from the program. For instance, it happened for me, so I know it can happen. Um, if it happens for you, you have to go into Stellarium sourceword.net wiki index php start catalogs i'm going to put this in the description below on the video here it does say that it's not no longer accurate but it is the the catalogs that you need to download if you want the additional catalogs now it's very important for me to here to say that you don't need these catalogs they are not mandatory but they will give you some more resolution on the stars that you can see now in all honesty most of the stars that you can find in this catalog here are not stars that you can see um, with the naked eye. So, well, I tend to download them, but they are not absolutely necessary. And you can also see here that these catalogs here, up to magnitude twelve, uh, sorry, up to magnitude ten point five, they are in the they are in the package. But from ten point five up to eighteen. You need to download them as separate and then you can do it further down or click on them somewhere. You need to uh, you need to do it in the right way. But that's it. That's all you need to do in order to get Stellarium on your computer. And now let's go into the actual program. Now we are in Stellarium. As you can see, this is a relatively well it's a relatively simple setup. <laughs> You have the ground here, you have the sky here, and then you can see lots and lots of stars. Now you can zoom out, uh, sorry, zoom in. And the further you zoom in, the more stars you can see. <coughs> and that is also because some, some of the stars that you can see here, they are uh, some of the zooms that you can do here, they are uh, magnitude dependent. So the further you zoom in, the most stars you can see. I suppose that's that's self-explanatory. Now, in order to start with this program, there are stuff you need to do. And the first thing you actually need to do is to go into um, location window here. And then from a drop-down list here, or from the map here, I think you can, no, you can expand it. Or well, what? Yes, you can. You can expand it a little bit. Let me see if I can just there. As you can see, you have the map here, and then you can sort of roughly, I think you, can, you should be able to zoom in, but then you can sort of roughly pinpoint your position. If you have latitude and longitude and elevation, you can get that. If you have a GPS, um, 
enabled, you can get that. You should also be able to use the get location from from uh, the network. And um, well, in my case, I have chosen the Copenhagen University Observatory. That's relatively close to where I am. It's it's fine enough. And then you should uh, select your um, position and location, and that's it. We have some more options here. You can say the sky and viewing options. In this case, we have stereographic. You can also use um, perspective. Um, and you can set the much viewport you want to offset it. You can do lots of stuff in here that I usually don't use. But you can see here how much you get. If you use perspective, you get 120 degrees as the maximum field of view. If you use stereographic, you get 235. I tend to go actually with perspective. You can use fisheye, autographic. There's lots of different projections that you can use here. <clears throat> That's for the sky. You can set scales and limit magnitude and all kinds of different stuff that you don't need to worry about at the moment. For SSOs, solar system objects, uh, you can use more accurate 3D models where available. I would usually tend to do that. I don't enable your orbits. I also don't enable your trails because I find it to, to uh, occlude uh, this view, view screen. But if you want to see that, you can enable it. Deep sky objects. Well, you can choose from all kinds of different catalogs that you want to have. For what we're going to work with here, uh, the MCOL analog, the Monsieur catalog, the new general catalog, and the uh, IC catalog, um, that should be enough. Then you can use markings, you can set colors, you can do lots of different things that is not really necessary. Um, you can set what kind of star law you want to use. The, you can use Japanese, uh, Korean, depending on where you're from and what interest you have. Then you can do some. You can use uh, surveys if you want to use the two millimeter survey. And well, there are loads and loads of different surveys that you can put into your view if you want to do that. But we're not going to do that here. Then we have the configuration window. That's relatively important. The first thing you need to do when you have set up everything uh, in uh, Stellarium the way you want it is that you need to go into to the configuration window here and then say save view and save settings. If you haven't done anything with your, with your view or if you have done something with your view that, that is just, just for this session, then you can exclude this. But if you're setting up your first um, settings like I've they instructed you in to do now that you want to change the setup and uh, the, the position you are in and all those things, then you need to save your settings. And that is going to write them to a little settings files. Information, you can choose what information you want. I will usually go with all that you can get. In here, you have the extras. Now you can see here, if I try to download it, it says error downloading star rate, ever, cr ever creating SSL context. And you can retry and retry and retry. That is why I went into the, the uh, web page in order to get it there. Then you have, uh, you can set the system date and time and you can, you can change that time tools. Well, you can say spherical mirror distortion if you want that. You can use a disk viewport, gravity labels, all kinds of different things that you, that you want to, if you want to enable it. I usually tend to go with the, um, the ordinary stuff and then change the things down here in this menu here which we're going to look at next scripts we are not going to do any scripts and plugins we are not going to work with any plugins not at the moment that is but let's go into the main and say save view and save settings now we are absolutely sure that when we start up stellarium the next time not only will we see this direction here well that's probably not as important but we will get the same viewport settings and we will get the save settings. We'll get the same settings that we have set here. Now, obviously, since I ran the program before, my settings are set roughly the way I want it. And the thing is, let me just say that, that I did actually record this video that I wanted to publish relatively soon after I made the first video. The problem was, unfortunately, that is, 
that uh, the video was useless. I have set um, Bandicam to record my screen, well, you know, like a desktop recording. And for some reason, it only got the background image of Stellarium, so you could see the stars like you see it now, but there were no menu down here. There were no menu like this. There were no menu here. There were no mouse. There were actually absolutely nothing. So that is why I had to do it again. And then a lot of stuff came up. All right. So now that we have the basics of uh, the basic setup on Stellarium done, let me tell you about what I want to show you in this video here. Now in the former, le the first lecture, the only lecture, <laughs> I told you a little about a little bit about um, the coordinate system that we use on the sky, and also the constellations that we have on the sky. So I think I wanted to continue in the same area in here, and then we're going to in the time coming up, we're going to uh, use the larium in in order to sort of expand on the theory that we have because the 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 thing about Stellarium that makes it so useful in lectures like these is that we can use them in the daytime we, we can use stellarium in the daytime now obviously i will say that right away also as an amateur astronomer there is nothing like being out under the sky itself and watching the real stars it this is not a substitute in any way but it is a useful replacement in order to sort of do sessions like this do teaching, um, classroom teaching, whatever you want to call it. This is obviously not a classroom in in, uh, in sort of the ordinary sense, but it is a way to sort of introduce the night sky without actually having it to be dark. And also because these are YouTube videos, I can't just travel all the world around in order to show all of you the night sky. And, and the same way, you cannot just take a plane and then fly to Denmark in order for me to show you around on the night sky. Even though that might be funny, but nevertheless, you cannot do that. And I can't expect you to do that. So the mutual ground that we have is an, sort of an, a computer-based uh, observatory like this. Let's get started with the first thing. The first thing I want to introduce to you is the two kind of coordinate systems that we have on the night sky. I told you it, told you about it before. We have the um, altitude azimuth, and then we have the rect ascension declination. And in here you have different things you can enable. And here you can see we have the equatorial grid. You can also use the E as a shortcut. We have the azimuthal, azimuthal grid which is the C, and then we have the ecliptic grid. Now we are going to use um, these two. So I'm going to press E and C or C. Let's disable uh, the equatorial for the moment. These are the alt as grid. So we have altitude and we have azimuth. Now, as you can see, we have degrees out here from, sorry, <laughs> from zero all the way up to 90 degrees, which is up here, there, no, sorry, but there should be 90 degrees, 90 degrees is here, obviously. We also have degrees down here, as you can see, all the way around from, let's see if I can find zero, it should be somewhere around here. And then we have all the different, the different um, degrees all the way around uh, the night sky. This is also the setup that most telescopes, uh, professional telescopes tend to use. Let me just show you, sorry, I bumped the microphone. Let me just show you something interesting here. So let's try to uh, go back in time <laughs> and uh, find a suitable object. Let's just stub it right somewhere around just before we get to sunset. Because then I'm going to show you something what is called there. I think we should go a little bit forward. Up oh, there. One of the things that when we, let me see if I can find the Andromeda galaxy, it is here. No, this is not, but nevertheless, we can use it. And then we need to uh, center on this. Now we should follow it around. So let's go all the way. Let's enable 
viewport like uh, yeah that's okay we don't need a crosshair and uh, no we'll do like this uh, yeah no no like this all right so this is roughly how you would look through it in an altitude azimuth telescope let me just uh, see if I can change this to, yeah, something like that. And let me just slowly try to um, forward, fast forward time. And what I want you to notice is that this object will begin to rotate in the viewport. It should do that, nevertheless. See, it rotates around. So let's try to go back a little bit. like that and let's turn this off let's just zoom in now as you can see uh no it turned it off let me just turn it i had to uh, restart the program because for some reason i couldn't get it to do what i wanted to do but i found the same object again um it says it's a star but i think this is the pinwheel galaxy i'm pretty sure it is that and as you can see, this grid here it is slowly moving around. And that is because this object here is sort of relatively moving to the background. Um, it will move over the sky because these don't have this this don't have fixed coordinates with time when we're talking about azimuth and altitude. It does have it. When we're talking about recession and declination but let me just try to fast forward again so you can see that this grid here stays fixed relative to um, the position of the telescope or your eyes but this object here will rotate inside it just like i showed you before you can see because the coordinate well the, the object is not rotating inside it but because the coordinate system is moving like it is now, the object will rotate inside um, the night sky as I showed you before. It should have been rotating. I'm not sure why it doesn't do that. But as you can see, these are the azimuth altitude coordinate system. And before I go into the same viewport again and, and screw, <laughs> screw up the uh, coordinate system um, here, let me just um, go a little bit back in time, like that. And let's change it to the equatorial grid again. Now, as you can see here, this grid shouldn't move relative to the position. Let me just try to fast forward a little bit. As you can see, now it's rotating. So that was the... Now you can see it is rotating across the sky as time is going. But you can see the coordinate system remains fixed. And this is the rectization and declination coordinate system. Now down here we have a button here where we can go between an equatorial and azimuthal mount. So let's change to the equatorial mount. Now as you can see if I zoom out, this mount here is a little skewed compared to the ground let me show you if we pull in the the uh, equatorial uh, sorry the azimuthal um, coordinate system you can see that this telescope here is fixed with respect to the rect ascension and declination but it is not fixed with respect to the azimuthal altitude prediction now the reason why we usually tend to use Rect ascension and declination instead of um, azimuth and altitude is that you can see here the sky has a fixed point. This is the north celestial pole. So this is basically if you could sort of imagine the Earth as being a big um, um, spinning ball with uh, I'm not sure what it called um, pinwheel. Yeah, I think it's a pinwheel um, with a long stick through it then that stick would point up to the North Celestial Pole. And this is where we have the North Star. So uh, this is why amateur astronomers usually align their telescopes against the North Star. It's because it's relatively close to the North Celestial Pole. Now, 
the, the advantage of this is that when we find an object on the sky and we sort of focus on it, let's try to do that. So we're going to say um, center on the selected object. As you can see now, we don't have more than one rotating axis. This also explains why when we just viewed it in the altitude azimuth prediction or the telescope that we had the coordinate system moving around and just try to fast forward time now. As you can see, we have this coordinate system moving with respect to the object, but it doesn't move uh, with respect to the <clears throat> uh, equatorial projection, the uh, rect ascension and declination. And this also means that when we have an altitude azimuth telescope, in order to keep that telescope locked on an object, it needs to move in two directions. It needs to move up and to the side, sort of in a, in a smooth motion. When we have an equatorial mount, it only needs to move in one direction. As you can see, we this direction here, which is the rect ascension, that doesn't move. It's only the declination axis that moves. Let me just show you. Let's try to fast forward time. As you can see again, the altitude azimuth object, uh, sorry, uh, coordinate system is moving with respect to the object, but the uh, the rect ascension and declination coordinate system remains exactly fixed. Also, the object doesn't rotate anymore. Let me just show you that. Let's turn it to this. Now it doesn't seem that it is rotating. But it is, let me try to, you can see it is rotating across the sky. If we go for azimuth of grid, we have degrees up here and we have degrees out here or here. If we enable the uh, equatorial mount and go for the equatorial grid instead, we have hours up here and then we have degrees down here. Now, you can see that this is a bit strange, you can see, because we have zero degrees here. And then we have minus degrees. And that is why you cannot just, when you look at a position, the cats here are going completely insane because it's nighttime and they are very active. And they are two, and they are kittens, and they are, well, you know how kittens are if you have them. But as you, so, so when you look at the sort of the address, or what you want to call it, for an object, let me just take one like this. You can see here, the address or the, the position, whatever you want to call it, it is uh, rect ascension, declination. On this date, it is zero, 44, zero hours, 44 minutes, 36 seconds, 36.10 seconds, minus 17 degrees, 52 arc minutes, and 33.3 .3 arc seconds. And it would seem sort of reasonable that anything below zero degrees, you could not, you wouldn't be able to observe that, but you do that. So that is one thing that you need to be aware that you don't confuse uh, the uh, alt as position. You can see this is plus 16 degrees, that you don't confuse that with the uh, declination degrees, because those can be minus and you can still observe them from the, uh, northern hemisphere and also in in the same way for the southern hemisphere you cannot just conclude that because something is plus degrees in the declination that you cannot view it uh, from the uh, southern hemisphere this is sort of the basic usage that we have for the northern uh, sorry the rect ascension and declination now we're going to go to the next subject and that is constellations let me just remove this so one of the things that you can use a program like this for also, and this is for the most part now, the thing that I want you to use it for, is to sort of train yourself in finding the different constellations around on the night sky. So the first thing that you can do, so if you see here, we have constellation lines, we have constellation labels, we have constellation arts, and then we have some boundaries and asterism and asterism labels of lines and labels. So first of all, let's try to enable the constellation lines. Now, now you can see we have the lines for all the constellations. So let me just see if I can point some of them out. This is uh, Taurus 
or the bull. This is Orion with Beetle Goose, uh, Beetle Goose and Rigel. This is um, Cass and Pollux, the twins, or Gemini. Capella, I really can't remember that. Um, but we're going to get the names now. This, of course, is the Big Dipper, or as we know it here in, in, in Scandinavia. This is uh, Big Bear. It's also called... Yeah, of course, I cannot remember that now. But this, this is the Big Bear. And here we have the Little Bear, or the Little Dipper. I do believe this is the Snake, or the Serpent. This is the Lyre, with Vega. And this is the Swan, or some also call it the Northern Cross, something like that. So uh, with these lines here, you can sort of train yourself in looking at these formations that are around here. And, and trust me when I say that it actually does help. It does help you to look at it like this. And that is why you can take a computer with you like this. If you have a little laptop, you can install this program. And then here you can go for night mode. You can see it all turns red. And why red? Well, our eyes are mostly sensitive to green and they are less sensitive to red. So that means that when we look at something that, it, that has red light, we will not disturb our night vision as much as if we look at it, looked at it like, like it is like this. So you can, you can test, it for, test it for yourself that if you turn off all the light, in your apartment or your house or your room and then you sort of keep your eyes closed for something like 15 20 minutes or something like that and then you open your eyes and turn on your monitor and then have this here and then turn off the monitor again and then look around you will tend to see less if you turned it to the red and did the same so uh, you can take this out with you you can also just look at it inside and then go out to check the different constellations. Now, this is uh, the constellation lines. Let me enable something that I told you a little bit about, and this is the boundaries. Now, if we want to look at it scientifically, this is how astronomers tend to interpret constellations. Now, we don't interpret constellations as these uh, figures like this. Let me just turn on the constellation art and the names. So we don't see it as Cetus uh, or uh, the fish Pishes or Pegasus or Aquarius or Iculus or Delphinus or uh, uh, Vulpecula or Sagitta or Cygnus the Swan or Draco the Dragon, or, oh yes, Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and Ursa Major, the Little Bear, the Lynx, we don't see them as that. That is not how professional uh, just, uh, astronomers, the Little Dog, Canis Minor, this is not how we see um, constellations. We see them only as these boundaries, sorry, <laughs> um, we only see them as these boundaries here. So if we took Taurus, for example, let me just take, um, let me see if I can find some interesting object in here. Let's take this for example. Uh, yeah, this is a star, but this is sort of a this is uh some kind of nebula. So if we wanted to categorize this nebula here, we would give it a name, and then we would say that it is something something, Tauri or Taurus. So signifying that this object here is within the boundary lines of Taurus. Now, obviously, when you go out and look on the night sky, I don't expect you to see it like this because that would be completely ridiculous. What I would suggest that you do is that you enable the constellation lines and the constellation labels. You can also enable the artwork if you want to look at it, but in my opinion, it doesn't really give you much. Right now you can see why this is called Lara, you can see why this is called Cygnus the Swan and all those things. But other than that, it doesn't really give you anything other than nice pictures. So Camelopardalis, 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 yeah. It looks like a uh, giraffe. It looks like that. And we have the bull here, of course, and yeah, so on, so on. Orion the hunter which is Klob, 
and his skin. Use I, I, I tend to see it as uh, I have heard that it is a shield, not a skin, but a shield and a sword. But nevertheless, well, this is Orion. We have Monoceros, and uh, yeah. So you can enable that if you want to, but my suggestion would be that you enable it like this. And then you try to sort of find this, don't try to sort of go for, well, I'm going to <laughs> learn uh, Eculeus and Delphinius and Sagita and uh, Vulpicula. I'm going to learn them, them uh, uh, from the memory and then I can find these three because Honestly, I wouldn't seriously don't think that anyone could find this. Really, I can't. Maybe this second set because those are relatively bright stars on the line, right? But <laughs> other than that, so go for the larger ones, Aquarius, for example. I'm just Aquarius here, um, Piscis, the fishes. The fishes here, Pegasus, Andromeda, um, Perseus, Auriga, Taurus, Gemini, Orion, and why, and of course Ursa Major and Ursa Minor and Draco. So why do you want to learn that? Let me give you the most, um, let me see if it is actually here. The most, it should be because it's circumpolar. We have also a search option, so we can search for the Andromeda Galaxy. And it is here, by the way. This is, and why did I choose that? Well, it is because the Andromeda Galaxy is, in what I know, the only one of the few galaxies that you can actually see with the naked eye. Now, if you find this on the sky, don't be disappointed because it will just be a little blob of light. You will not be able to discern any structures like you can do on this image here. It will just, it will look like a little bright blob on the sky. And that's all you can see. Even if you use a telescope, it will be like that. But let's say you want to find this on the night sky. Now there are different ways that you can do that. And this is what most people call a star jumping method. So let me just show you that. Now, one of the, actually Pegasus, I would say it's relative, it's not that easy to find on the night sky, but Cassiopeia here, the W, let me just turn it off, these lines here. This W here, it's relatively, easy to find. So if you find that, you can sort of use these lines here. You can see these three stars here, the brightest stars, and tend to see them as an, an arrow. So if this is the arrow, then you want to go down like this to this star here. Then you find this bright star here. You have a bright star here and you have a bright star here. So you have sort of a, oh, sorry, a little, um, um, little flaw. When you find that flaw, this middle star here, then you go up to the next star and up to that star. And around this star here, you should be able to see the Andromeda galaxy. Now, this is what is called uh, the star jumping method because you sort of jump from star to star to star. So uh, this is one way to find it. This is the way that I would usually try to find the Andromeda galaxy using my naked eye. So I would usually go, I would go for, first and foremost, go for Cassiopeia, because when you look at the night sky, there's a lot of stars here, but when you do look at the night sky like this, this W here, as I tend to call it, or whatever you want to call it, an M, upside down M, it is relatively easily found. And then you find the brightest three stars, and then you just use that as an arrow to go down to this star here. Now, if you use that as an arrow, you might find the Andromeda galaxy on the way down, and obviously then you know, don't need to do this down here. But if you don't, then you just follow it down to the next brightest star that you see, and then you go to one side, you find that bright star, and go back and go out here, then you find that bright star, and then you know this is the star that you want, and then you find sort of two dimmer stars out here. Simply just go up, 
against towards here. And then the third star uh, you find will be quite close to uh, the Andromeda galaxy. Another example, and that's even more easily found, is the Orion Nebula. Let me just turn back, to, uh, increase time a little bit so we get it a little bit higher on the... Let me just go for where. This is how it would look on my night sky right now. All right, so uh, obviously this is relatively bright compared to what you uh, would see. But again, you can do the same thing. So if you want to find the Orion Nebula, then you try to find the bull. And Taurus is most easily find, found by getting all the barren here. Then you can see you have this uh, little um, angle here of stars. This is the bull. And when you have found the bull, you just go sort of straight down, sort of... Um, down towards uh, what you would call it uh, uh, southwest, a little bit southwest, and then you find these four bright stars here that look sort of a little trapezium or something like that, with three star bright stars in the middle. And the two brightest stars is a red giant called Betelgeuse and a blue giant called Rydal. But when you find these stars here, then you go into the middle star and go straight down and then you will find some bright objects down here and this little hazy bit here in the middle will be the Orion Nebula. You can also see the Orion Nebula with the naked eye but obviously again not with colors or anything like that. You will only be able to see it um, as sort of a hazy blob or something like that. You will be able to see it, but not as much as you could probably hope for. In sort of the, the first section here, I will ask you to, uh, to try to get uh, familiar with the uh, Stellarium and try to find your way around. Now, I use the mouse to get around, but you can also use the keyboard arrows, uh, arrows here to, uh, to move around. And in, in some sense, that is even more, more useful than just um, using the mouse, but um, because it gives sort of a better sense on how you move around. If you want to sort of have any kind of homework or whatever you want to call it, I would suggest that you uh, open the program. I wouldn't ask you to sort of try to get familiar with uh, the direct ascension and declination um, or the coordinate system in in any case, because you you can really you can you can use the these uh, coordinates here, the erect ascension and declination lines here to in, in order to sort of get an, get an idea of, you can see that Draco is roughly seven hours and uh, 65 degrees. If we press it, you can see it is uh, 17 hours and 65 degrees. So you can use it in that sense. But other than that, you you wouldn't really get that used to uh, to using it. But you can do it if you want to. And it's not a bad idea. But I will, what I will suggest you to do is that you enable the, um, the uh, constellation lines and constellation labels. And then you try first to sort of look like some, on something like Cygnus, for instance, the swan. Um, look at the, the structure it has, how the wings look. And then you turn off the constellation lines and maybe even the name. And then you try to see, well, it was something like this. And then you have Danib and it goes down here. And sort of try to familiar, familiarize yourself with the structure. For instance, Vega here is the brightest star in the Lyra. So you go sort of, it's it, this little trapezium here. And then you have the bright star out here. And you can see it's like this, right? So try to get yourself familiar with how the constellations look and not so much the names that is a good idea but the names is useful if you want to communicate the position of something with a friend so for instance if you want to tell them well you need to go out and look on this you need to go out to look on a constellation and if you go northwest of that constellation you will find another constellation and then you will find this object he will go or she will go what are you talking about 
But if you, for instance, say, well, you need to find Ursa Major or the Big Dipper, and then you need to go sort of roughly uh, northwest of that, and then you will find Ursa Minor, and then from there you will go to Cepheus, and from there you will find the object that I'm talking about. Now, this is not an object that you will be able to see with the naked eye, but this was just a, an idea of how you could do it. So this is basic, this is generally what you want to use the name for, the names for. And also, obviously, if this were a high school uh, classroom with a final exam at the end, I would ask you to name uh, these um, constellations because this is something that you have to know. But for now, I will say the important thing for you is, because there is no exam, not by me in any, in any case, the important thing for you will be to be able to navigate yourself, uh, navigate around on the night sky and using the constellations as sort of fixed points on the sky that you can, you can use as navigation tools, they are very important. Obviously, if you have an equatorial mount with all the bells and whistles, computerized telescopes, all that, you, you really don't need to know the names of the constellations more so than you need to know the name of the brightest stars because the brightest stars are the ones that are the ones that you usually use to align your telescope unless of course you have something like a sky watcher big mount like mine a eq6 pro or something like that the new eq8 i think it's called the big one um you can use a program like um eq mod to align your telescope against basically anything that you can find on the night sky as long as you know what it is stars in my opinion even if you use a camera like i do is still the number one way to go because they are easily found and the bright stars they really pop out on your camera but that is something for another discussion nevertheless this is what i wanted to tell you about on um using uh Solarium. There will be more videos like this to uh, go more in depth with it. I hope you have learned something. As always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, you can give it a thumbs down, but well, don't do that, right? And then, of course, subscribe to my channel, and then you will get notifications whenever I do something new, upload anything new. Of course, if you also press that little bell next to it. But uh, yes, I will see you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.